Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Um, we're so excited to have this conversation. Um, and I know that we have lots of folks who are also joining us online who couldn't be here in person. Um, we have been waiting for this conversation for over a year since last year's Parshat Mishpatim, which you're going to hear about at some point in this conversation. And I want to say I'm so glad that we waited and that we're um, having it now um, because a lot's happened in the last year, and I'm really excited to hear how your thinking has um, developed. And I read the book last year and then read it again a couple days ago, and I have changed and developed over the last year, too. Um, and so I'm really just thrilled that we get to do this. So thank you all for being here, um, and welcome. Um, I am very happy to introduce you to our beloved Dr. Lauren Buckman, um, who was a professor um, at University of California, Berkeley, went on to be the president of three different colleges, most recently the Arts College in Pasadena, I think it's called the Arts Center College of Design in Pasadena, um, and is a very accomplished um, writer, director, actor, um, and teacher, and most importantly to us, is an absolutely beloved community member um, and somebody who, from the moment he accidentally walked through the door, Eddie Carr, um, which maybe he'll tell you about at some point, um, has become so integral to the very fabric of our community, um, who, who brings this incredible wealth of skills as an artist and as a college president, but really is a spiritual center, Eddie Carr, in many ways. And that might be why people often slip up and introduce him as Rabbi Buckman. Um, and so um, I want to just give a, a special shout out to Ethan Goldstein, who made a practice of doing that at our board meetings. Um, but yeah, he, he was the one who ordained me. Yeah, yeah he yeah. gave you ordained. Yeah. I heard today Hillel was ordained too by David Hirsch. I don't know if you caught that. Uh, he, he, Morris's, uh, Rabbi Panitz's ordination went to Hillel. So <laughs> um, you're allowed to trade only once. So, um, But it is, uh, it's been an incredible honor and privilege and great joy to um, to grow in friendship with you and to help grow this community with you over the course of these past several years since you've become so integral to us. And um, Lauren's a, a member of our board and also is the chair of our capital campaign. And so that means we spend a lot of time together. And I have gotten to see what you write about here in practice, I, I mean, on the daily. And it is incredible um, to witness you literally a walking piece of art in this world. And so thank you for being part of this community, for being my friend, and for sharing your wisdom with us today. Um, so can we just start, Lauren, will you just tell us a little bit about Make to Know, uh, um, From Spaces of Uncertainty to Creative Discovery, um, why you set, why this is, this is his, your second book, right? It is, yeah. So why you set out to write this book when you did, and what the most important, what the very essence is of it that you'd want to share with us? Uh, Thank you. Shabbat shalom, everyone. And thank you for being here. And thank you, Rabbi and David Mazaltov. Yeah, pretty great. All that you remembered in 50 years. That was pretty good, yeah. Um, uh, look, the book came um, from uh, many different places. Certainly my own personal experience of um, the kind of learner and creator I discovered that I was. I think this goes back to a very young age, but it was uh, in my college years that I realized that 
Um, I could go into places where I really didn't know what it was I wanted to create. I didn't know where I was going to you know, take a given project. And this happened for me particularly in a directing assignment I got in college, a theater directing assignment, to direct a one-act play. And I hadn't a clue what to do with it. But the genius of the teaching and of the pedagogy that I experienced was, they just said, you want to direct? They tossed us in the deep end and said, direct something. And from that, you will discover that from that, you will be able to wrestle with questions and ideas and thoughts, and you'll be able to figure it out. And so I remember very well, terrified about going. I knew enough to cast a play, and I knew enough to schedule the first rehearsal. But honestly, after that, I had no clue what I was doing. And I went to the first rehearsal, and something opened up. It's uh, partly the virtue of necessity descended on me, and I was able to suddenly be able to engage. But there I was. We were batting around ideas. We were studying character. We were moving people around in space. We were discovering collectively what this short checkoff comic romp might be, and it happened in the making. And then all sorts of triggers started going off for me in terms of when, when I was younger, when I was a child, preoccupied with the sense that it must be geniuses who do art. It must be geniuses who create. And how do they create? And how did I learn about their creation? Maybe this is the same for you. We learned about it because they had great vision, and their work was all about manifesting vision. Mm -hmm. And when I walked into that rehearsal hall, I had zero vision, but something came through the revelatory process of engaging a rehearsal of making in theatrical, in the theatrical sense. How did we learn about it? Michelangelo saw the angel in the stone and carved out until he set it free. It was pure genius. But when you talk to artists and designers, and certainly it was my personal experience, that's not what they say. Oh, that's what most of them, most of them do not talk about their work as a manifestation of some preconceived vision. On the contrary, they talk about it as having an idea, a notion, a question, an urge, one said a stomach ache, to enter into a place of uncertainty. That place of uncertainty is destabilizing, it's frightening, but it's also a deeply creative space. And so it was beginning to learn about that and discover that that was the impetus for the book. And then one more really important piece was brilliant student after brilliant student at Art Center College for Design would say to me, I can't do this project because I don't have it all figured out. And what came to me really clearly is that the teaching, along with all the skill and all the technique and all that we needed to do in educating them, what was so important is go in, begin the making, mm -hmm. and in the making, there will be a discovery. And so it was a book written for my students in large measure. I mean, it's a really, it's a really, um it's really a, sp a very spiritual and emotional and psychological journey because we're so terrified of being in the space of uncertainty. And Rabbi Panitz was saying earlier that you wrote in the margins of your book, and, and um, you know, as I was reading the book too, I was thinking about all of the moments where I felt Torah coming off the page. And um, you know, our rabbis say that the Torah had to be given in the desert, that Bamidbar, it had to be given in this place of wild uncertainty, which is, it's terrifying to be out in the desert at night. Um, and yet mm. we had to be there in order to be able to receive a Torah that could actually land in our hearts. And yet it's exactly where we don't want to be. Um, and we build all these structures in our lives to kind of control and contain. And, and I think part of what you're arguing is you have to remove yourself from the safety of it in order to be in this artistic journey, artistic struggle. I'm so, I'm so moved by that idea because it's, it's so counterintuitive for us. Right. And it's, it's um, also a capacity to understand that there, we, we need structure, we need framing, 
but within that is where mm -hmm. the exploration can happen. So improvisation is a great way to think about it. Improvisation can't come out of nowhere. You need a context, you need a frame. Miles Davis needs a Gershwin melody to riff off mm -hmm. of. There's mm -hmm. always that kind of piece that's happening and how we work with that, how we let the, the, the breeze blow through, not tighten it up so much that we can't engage right. in a making that leads to a discovery. Do we have any improv people in the room right now? Anyone who's done? Yes, Wendy. I could so totally see that. Um, I, I want to share with you what happened to David Light on the first day of his MFA program. OK, can I share this? Um, I feel like it's half my story now at this point, right? Um, David went to film school, um, showed up the first day. It's this room full of a couple hundred of like the smartest, most creative, you know, interesting, young, uh, budding filmmakers. And uh, they broke the, all, the room into small groups of, um, of four or so people. And they handed them cameras because, yes, few of us had cell phones when we started graduate school, which is hard to believe. And said, go out into New York City and create a three to five minute short film. And these groups went out and they came back at the end of the day, like eight hours later, to share what they had come up with. And people were so angry and despondent and they had been fighting in their groups and nobody had come up with anything worthwhile. And so, and I remember you came home that night and you're like, it, film school's a disaster. And then the next day, David went back to the second day and they broke them up into groups of four people and they handed them cameras and they said, go out into New York City and create a three to five minute film in which A gives something to B, B rejects it, and A reacts. And these students went out and made art. Mm -hmm. And I was so struck by that, and it was so inspiring, and they were all different. The films were inc like beautiful and thoughtful and poetic. And, and I was in rabbinical school at the time, and when you told me the story, I'm like, oh, that's, I think that's the essence of the halachic process. Like That's what we're trying to do, create enough of a container that art can be born inside. Because if everything's possible, then there's no, there's no art. But if you have some boundaries, then you can live in the uncertainty without being absolutely terrified that, like, that all the night terrors are gonna come grab you. So it's about being willing to be in the wilderness, but at least knowing that there's like a shomer. There's gonna be a guard at the edge of the camp that will protect you and knowing exactly where the edge of that camp is. Right, and that structure is so important in so many different ways. And by the way, this, this, a lot of this book um, uh, are, is uh, uh, telling the stories of uh, scores of artists and designers that I interviewed, talking about their process, talking about how they go about it, including our beloved Hillel, um, and what the Make to Know process is for them and how they go about it, and what their stories are. And so a lot, all of the learning really comes from them and is filtered through them. And one of the things, I mean, there's a lot that they say, and a couple that come to mind right now are, um, does, what you learn from designers is that limitation and constraints open up creative possibility. Right along, exactly echoing what you were just suggesting. And that's, I mean, you think about it in, you know, in a kind of an opposite way, but in fact, constraints are what, tell me where yes. my limitations are and then I can, I can begin to, That's I, Shabbos, I, I begin right? to make something. I feel yeah. that way as a, sh as a Shabbat observer. It's like the limitations are what make it possible for exactly us to have right. these experiences and encounters. And then within that, you can be creative. Yes. Within that, you can discover, not necessarily driven by a predetermined vision, but open to what the possibilities are. The artist Anne Hamilton, who was enormously influential um, to me in my thinking about all this, talks about a practice of responsiveness. And if I had to kind of talk about the essence of the entire book, I would say that's what it is. That's, you, you find yourself within a context, within a structure, or sometimes in a kind of open sea. How many writers told me they go in with a certain notion, but they really don't know where they're going. And the image that one of the writers used was, you're on a raft in an open sea. You might as well just start paddling and mm -hmm. heading in one direction whether, and seeing what can be discovered mm -hmm. along the way. And all of it has to do with a kind of discipline of, which I also think is very spiritual and very Jewish, it's uh, being able to, um, uh, the discipline and the practice of being responsive, mm -hmm. of being able to listen to hear to and and to be able to respond in the moment accordingly and that comes through not 
not anything passive, even if you're waiting for it to come. It's an active waiting, as one as Rebecca Mendez talks about. But it's also um, it's also a a, a kind of um, making and working that allows you uh, allows you to be responsive to what is coming to you through that act of making. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Whether you're painting or whether you're in clay, whether you're like Anne Hamilton engaging in space or like Edgar Arsenault engaging in time, or if it's, if it's the, the engagement with materials of paint on the canvas and what that means. Th these artists talk beautifully about like this dialogue they have um, with the charcoal and the paper. And the charcoal, you put the char you, there's this three-way dialogue of the artist and the charcoal and the paper, and the charcoal goes onto the paper and the paper comes back and says, oh, you gave me that, I'm gonna give you this. Mm. And I'm going to go back and give you that. And there's this wonderful kind of magical conversation that happens that moves it forward into something that you could never have known what it was going to be when you began. Oh, it's so, I actually, this is one of the reasons that I'm glad we're having this now because I'm a very um, amateur, pot, you know, I, I had joined a pottery studio during my sabbatical and, um, and it gives me so much joy. And, in fact, one of the one day at the end of sabbatical, I came home and I, I mean, at my pot. I tried to make. Th I threw three bowls and like two of them fell, and I felt so terrible. And I, I called David on the way home, and I was just so upset. And he said, "You know, you're not doing this because there's a dearth of bowls in our house, right? <laughs> and so, like, you're doing it for the experience." Of Can I call you sometimes something. too? That's really helpful. <laughs> it's a good. Yeah. It, the, yeah. Yes, and so. Um, and I feel that at the wheel, as somebody who really like lacks any artistic ability out, outside of my you know beginner pottery skill, but like I feel like I'm in dialogue with this piece of clay, and I sit down thinking I'm going to make a hand washer, and then I'm like, oh, look at that, a bowl inside a bowl came out. That's interesting. Or like it's a mug. Okay, that'll be a nice gift. Like the the clay is sort of telling it's it's telling me as much as I'm telling it, That's and right. That's right. I feel I can understand a little bit of some of what some of our artists here experience just from that dynamic. And I I want to let the cl the clay win too because then we both win. Like I'm, we're not in a battle with each other. We're sort of learning each other. And then look at that. I'm so surprised because it's bigger than my head, which is also what happened with the car. Frankly, it's like I there was a there was a, a seed of an idea and a vision that was rooted in values, but then as the people came, it grew so far beyond the idea, and it became so much more beautiful than the idea ever was on its own. And so I resonate to that idea, like to the, to the way that you describe the, the process right. of creation. Right, you could have never known what Icar was gonna be until you started right. to make it. Right. That's right. Right, we had to actually launch, and in fact, I mean, just, just to like go, thinking back to those early, early moments, but, um, we had this first Shabbat service at Ikar that I think some of you were at. Um, and it was so wonderful. And I knew there was something here and thought, like, we should try this. But we had no money. We had no space. We had no staff, no supplies, no photocopier. And I went to talk to, I, I did one of these leadership weekends that happened to land right at the right moment. And I talked to Simon Greer, a friend of mine who was assigned to be my coach that weekend. And I said, I think what I need to do is hold my job and we'll, like, you know, develop a business plan over the course of the next two years and we'll raise money. And he's like, you just have to do it. You just have to, you have to take the, the leap and believe in it. And maybe it won't turn out the way you want it to, or maybe you'll grow, you'll grow with it together. And it was exactly saying the very thesis of this book. So I, I find that very powerful. And a couple of things I want to pick up on that you just talked about that I think are interesting. One is, um, um, it, the the some, some have immediately responded to this as uh, oh this is a sort of making it up as you go along, and nothing's farther from the truth yeah. of what make to know really means, um, because what you bring are values and skill yeah. and commitment and a, 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 a lot of years of education and et cetera et cetera right all of that is incredibly a sense of ethics and all of that is incredibly important mm. to what it is that you're making. But that, to me, is the scaffolding that we stand on as we reach into places of uncertainty, as we reach into the unknown. Mm -hmm. And that piece, that uncertainty, is, is, is critical because we have to be willing to go there in all of its terrifying qualities, but nonetheless, it's incredible and infinite possibility. Mm 
right? And so we, 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 we need to move into that, not ignoring what we have. In fact, again, something that I, I would talk to my students about all the time is that their work in, in, in perfecting skill, learning those, those the, you know, in, to use the metaphor of music, really learning those, the, those scales, really understanding the, the discipline in its fundamental way and getting those 10,000 hours of practice, that is directly related to artistic and creative freedom. The greater the skill, the greater the artistic freedom. Mm. So there's this wonderful kind of relationship there. So that has to be part of what's going on. That's the scaffolding, but we reach. And talent is a huge piece of that as well, right? Talent being part of that scaffolding that we use, and some happen to be more talented than others. So you're, you, we're talking about the, the relationship between the artist and the clay, or the artist and the, the charcoal and the paper. Um, I want to talk about Rochelle for a moment, if we can, um, which <laughs> is the, the relationship between the artist and the, the partner or friend or teacher or guide who helps pull out from the artist the art. And I think this is something that is really uh, like powerful in, this, um, in the smashing of the idol of the lone genius. And we just saw Goodwill Hunting during uh, Cholomoed Pesach. And it, there's something, you, you mentioned Goodwill Hunting in the book, and there's something so intoxicating about the mythology of the lone genius who just like, as you said, flash of inspiration and boom, they're able to create something extraordinary in the world. But, it, but I think that what you're describing here is much more of a kind of like dynamic dialogue, give and take, and I asked Rochelle during the davening today, half Torah, um, how many times she had, <laughs> how many times she, she read the book, and right, like, in, and we're talking each section of the book, and then the book as a whole, and it doesn't have to be your spouse or partner that does this, but I think the, no, the notion of someone who's in dialogue with you and able to help you as the artist manifest Yeah, on and page. we were in dialogue a lot, and Rochelle was an incredible support. And she happens to be, and I will announce this here, and, and she happens to be the greatest editor on the planet. I mean, an unbelievable <laughs> reader, an unbelievable. Um, what she was able to discern from the writing and help shape it was, was extraordinary. It's not the first time she's heard me say that either. Um, so so one, one, part of what's in, interesting in all of that, too, is that... Well, I'll say two things. One is, whenever I talk to, and I talk to hundreds of people about this concept of make to know, and no one ever looked at me kind of quizzically and said, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh -huh, so there was something uh -huh. very personal immediately that seemed to, to resonate. But then I got worried and scared and a little neurotic and thought, <laughs> huh, maybe I'm just saying the sky's blue. Like, what else is new? And then the other thing, too, I thought is, I, I, I've got to be careful about setting up a straw man here. I don't want to do, I don't want to just set that up and say, this is, and then go to all these incredible artists and, and have them talk about it. And so I, I really tried to study historically, at least in Western culture, though it's true in other cultures as well, why we think about this. Why yeah. if you, yeah. if you engage with somebody and they say, well, what does an artist do? That, an artist has great vision. An artist is a genius and then manifests it. And then so I did this study and wrote that, that chapter, that essay, which, in which I look at three particular threads that have dominated the discourse about creativity. One is about genius and a preoccupation with genius. And it goes all the way back to the tutelary deities of the Roman Empire and, of, of kind of, and, and is very male in orientation and has complete etymology about procreation of the man and completely uh, cuts out most of the world. And um, there, there is a, a kind of a sense of, of, of genius that protects you and comes to you. And then in the Enlightenment and with Immanuel Kant, it changes to an internal part and somebody who is, becomes a genius. And uh, Elizabeth Gilbert sort of beautifully talks about this as genius historically in, in the West has gone from having genius to being genius. Mm. And a, deep preoccupation with it, and you look at the books, and you look at our films, and you look at popular culture, and you look at this incredible obsession with genius. Mm -hmm. We love it. And I am not saying that there are not geniuses am am among us. There are. Mm -hmm. But that skews how we think about the creative process. So that was one. Madness. The, art the, the artist yes. is mad. It's something else that we, we love and goes all the way back to Seneca and travels the way through, and you can think the artist is, is somehow 
uh, you know, off and mad and crazy, and we can learn from them, but we, you know, they, they're, they're, that's who they are, and again, skews who can be creative. And the other one, and the final one, is those who are divinely inspired. The muse is the example of that, going all the way back to Homer, right? Select, uh, the select few among us who the gods choose to channel their mm -hmm. brilliance, and we are the spokespeople of that. And when you start understanding how prevalent that is, you begin to understand, well, no wonder we think about creativity that way. Right, right. And, and, and it goes back to what you were saying, you're only creative at the wheel. That is so not true. And it's so not true for everybody in this room. We are makers, all of us. Humanity is built on a capacity to make. We make in relationship. We make in leadership. We make in our work. We make in our writing. We make in our thinking. We make in our parenting. We are makers. We are constantly going into places of the unknown. What parent in this room didn't go into a place of the unknown, but made it and discovered it as they went through? If we waited beforehand to figure it all out, we'd probably have zero population growth. I mean, yeah. it's just, we've got, we've got to, we've, we, we are, and, and this is the part where it, it, it has to transcend these limited notions of who is creative and what can be creative, and understand that this touches so many parts of our lives, the spiritual part being one of the, one of the greatest and most important, certainly a leadership part from my experience is that as well. It's, I want to talk to you about the way that inspiration comes, and I also am aware that there are a number of people in the room who yeah, are yeah. really are artists yeah. and people who've written books and have created music, and we want to hear from you, and so we'll have yeah, some time absolutely. for Q&A um, for sure, but I, there's something absolutely terrifying about, and on one hand, make to know is so inviting. It's like you don't have to have it figured out. You just have to be willing to take the first step. On the other hand, I know as a person who gives sermons, you know, most weeks for the last 20 years, that there is a moment where you're like, oh, I got it. And, so, you know, it's usually on Friday at 4.30 p.m. Sometimes it's during the Haftarah on Shabbos morning. And you're like, oh, my God. I think, I, I, you know, and then I run in the, I'm like, David, come in the coach's lounge in the back and let me see if this idea makes sense. But, like, there's a moment. And when the moment doesn't come, you're, then you're just kind of mailing it in, and like you're, it, you're, it's the work without the inspiration, and you, I can feel the difference, but it almost always comes. But then you're terrified because it might not come. Like each time that it works, yep. you're worried that I would, I worried that maybe I, it won't. And I, I was thinking as I was reading, as I was reading the book, um, I wonder what Hilla would think about that. I, I kept thinking that as I'm reading. I wonder what Hilla would think. And then you say, a singer and songwriter Hilla Tige um, <laughs> once said, and I'm like, oh, good, we get to hear what Hilla would say about it. But I feel like you, Hillel's described like sitting in the hot tub with his family, and he's like, hallelujah, I got yeah. it, and like runs out and goes to write it down. And there's some way that like the burst of inspiration, you say songwriters are different, by the way, from the rest of us normal mere mortals. And Jenny, I don't know how you feel about this, but. There, but I, I believe that for all and all, that I, while I so appreciate the constraints and sit down, and Amy Bender would say, tie your leg to the, you know, to, to the, the chair, chair yeah, yeah. for 90 minutes. That's what she advised me when I started my book. And it's in there, yeah. And it's in here. Yeah. Tie your leg to the chair and sit down for 90 minutes. Set a timer and don't get up. And like I appreciate all of the constraints and the push to make to know. And at the same time, there is this like creative burst that if it doesn't come, Ellen, how do you know what you're going to do in this living room to make it look transcendent? And I, I just, I don't know, uh, like, what, how, did, I mean, David, know me? Do you feel this too? That you're like, you're, you're gonna, you're writing, and it's important what you're saying, and it's you're gonna break ground. But the, but if the spark isn't there, if it doesn't come, then you're just kind of going through the motions of the of the art without, but it's not actually art. It's just kind of, it, it's sort of filler waiting. I, I'm terrified of that personally, as a person who's constantly like sort of making, as you would say. Yeah, and it and it and I understand the terror, and I and I and I share it. Um, different ways of thinking about it. Some experience it through the actual; they don't know, but through the process of the making, discover it. Um, and 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 one of the things I, I I'm particularly compelled by is um, somebody like Joan Didion, who talks about. She says, I would have no reason to write if I could access my thoughts in any other way. 
right. you know? So it, it's the act of writing and what she did in grieving both her husband and her daughter, right? It's the act of writing to, to really become in touch with herself and discover it. So it's in that absolute making. But do you know what the sing, single uh, most frequently uttered phrase was in this? I learned a lot from Hillel as well. From all the artists I discovered, I thought of the idea in the shower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was the one. It's, it's what happens when, and, and I find this so, I just love this, the creative pause. When you're not doing the writing, you're not in the studio, you're not writing that sermon, you're not engaged in, right. in, 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 that, in, that, in the space of that living room or in writing the song, you're in the hot tub. Right. And something is able to come. And so creativity and making, I think, is part of that moment. We tend to think about it's only when I'm in the studio or when I'm engaged in playing the keys. But in fact, it's in that moment, too, yeah. because we get into this world, what the novelist Amy Tan calls um, a cosmology. She uses, the, um, she uses quantum physics to describe her experience and about a cosmology that she builds. And she says, I, I know absolutely nothing about quantum physics, but I'm gonna use it as the metaphor anyway. And she talks about gravitational pull and particles and all kinds of things. And something occurs, and her amazing insight is, in the making, that universe begins to develop. Mm. And things come to you, and otherwise that may seem very random, in other contexts, mm -hmm. actually take on huge meaning. So she's writing a historical chapter of one of her novels, and she pulls, she talks about this, she pulls a, a book from the shelf, and she opens that book, and she looks at, it, opens it, and right there at that chapter yes. is exactly the reference that she needs that otherwise she probably wouldn't have noticed, but she's in that kind of yeah. space of creating with all its different dimensions, both writing and pulling books off and showering and driving and doing dishes. The cigarette break. Somebody writes in the book about cigarette the cigarette break. Like, I was much more creative when I smoked, she Right, said. right, yeah, exactly, because yeah, yeah, you have yeah. to leave and go outside. And you know, my High Holy Day sermons, I write in my sleep. And mm. like they all come in the middle of the night and I have a pen and paper by the bed and I'm like, oh, got it. I wake up, write it, and then it's hard to discern the writing in the morning. But, but I'm not just waiting for it. I am doing the research, I'm reading, I'm thinking, but I can't figure it out in the, in the waking hours. And right. so, and then in the night, I think my guard is let down a little bit and so I can access it. So right, right. I, I hear that. I want I to just tell you something that happened when I was, I wrote a book during sabbatical, which you know about, because I was stuck on chapter two and I was like, I'm trying to make to know. <laughs> chapters one, three, and five came out really quickly and easily, but then I had to go back and do chapters two and four and they were the worst. And so... I was really trying to, and then I thought maybe I should just do an odd number, uh, an odd chapter book. Like, why do I need a chapter two? Who said? So um, I, I took Amy's advice and I set the timer the first day and I'm like, I'm going to write for 90 minutes and I wrote for eight hours. And then the next day I wrote for nine hours and then I wrote for set. Like every day it was somewhere between seven and 10 hours for the time because I had a short little window to get the book out and I just kept writing and writing and writing. But most of it was horrible. As Hillel, you say this, you say something about this in your book, that most of the stuff you write, you're like, now, that, that, yes, am I, get, yes. Like most of it you have to throw away. And then I would sit down with David and read him like 40 pages of what should be a 10-page chapter. And he's like, no, 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 ooh, that's good. Mm. Like he would, so I felt a little bit like it was the Michelangelo experience of like there's something good in a 40-page you know, pay, you just have to be that, willing that to throw away. That came through your making it, though. That came through writing it down. Because right. I couldn't just sit there and think, what do I actually want to say here? It doesn't work like that. For, it, it really didn't. And so that's why I'm so glad to have had that experience, to now, reading it now, having gone through that, and seeing even the hard chapters. Like, you just have to write terrible, terrible drafts and be willing to throw it all away. I mean, I have this giant document that's like my throwaway document where I'd cut everything, everything that I cut went in that document. I hope nobody ever sees it. And, um, and then their little gems start to appear and then hopefully you can like build a, you know, a casing around, around the jewel. Um, but I, I, I think part of it, part of it is the Rochelle, David, like having somebody who's willing to say to you, yeah, that's really bad. You need to cut that out. Um, and part of it is just being willing to put stuff out that you know isn't going to be good. I remember Rabbi Pianitz once, we were talking before High Holy Days, and you said something like, I've written two sentences in the last eight hours. And 
because every word was a piece of poetry, right? And it really, what you could feel it when you were give, delivering that sermon on Erev Rosh Hashanah, which if you haven't heard, you should go back in here. Um, but I thought, oh, that's a, like, that's a particular mode of creating. And my mode that developed through the writing of the book was the opposite. It was like, just put every possible connection, every point, and then have a really like strong, harsh, self-critical eye or otherly critical eye that can look at it and say, no, 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 there's garbage, 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 but here's something, you know, here's the poetry in this sentence. And part of the, the, part of the practice of responsiveness is to be able to let that come in, but also part of the discipline is to do what you did and to know that you, you, gotta, you gotta transcend your ego, you gotta listen with a different part of yourself, and you gotta be uh, willing to give up what isn't working mm -hmm. and know what mm -hmm. isn't working and have that discipline. Amy Bender talks a lot about that actually in the book. Um, you gotta give up all your little darlings, oh, those yeah, sentences that, that you just love. They're just so beautiful and so fantastic, yeah. but really they're not adding anything. In fact, they're probably detracting from what you're trying to create and you have to have the discipline to be able to do that. I want to ask you one more question before we open it up, and I'd love if, if folks have thoughts or comments. Um, you know, we're in this building process at ICAR, and uh, Lauren and Jeremy and uh, Michelle and, and Melissa and I have sat in lots and lots of meetings with our architect, Barbara Bester. She's wonderful. Um, and I, I, I want, you do reflect a little bit on the process of building design in the book, and, um, and the way that, it, the, I, you talk about how Steve Jobs, like when in, in the very beginning, about how when they want, you know, the Apple store, we take it for granted now, but it was a total revolution in retail. The, the, the idea of creating a store that would feel that way when you walk into it. And so um, something that you wrote about that I didn't know about was that Jobs actually created a pr like a prototype of the store so that literally they could walk into it in a, in a giant warehouse and feel it. And then they're like, no, that doesn't, to move that around and like this isn't right and how thick should the ca countertops be and can you just reflect a little bit on our building process and how you, what you see as part of the it or it's sort of the heart of the iterative process here how the values become manifest in physical form from your vantage point through um, the process that we're engaged in together right and already in um I don't know how many years we've been we've been working with Barbara on the design. Already we've seen it take all kinds of shape. That it's it isn't, um, and and the story of the Apple Store is is is, is a perfect parallel because, you know, one would assume that um, it, it would just the, the great genius uh, deservedly called that um, uh, that 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 store would have just sort of burst from his head like right. uh, like Athena from Zeus. You know that that was that was what it was going to be. But there was. I had the opportunity to interview Tim Covey, who was the head designer of the store. He had absolutely not what happened. He hadn't a clue what he wanted. But he had values, and he had notions, and he had ideas. And partnership. And he had partnership. And he got into, they started on a whiteboard. I thought that that was the most amazing sentence, you know? That Steve Jobs started on a whiteboard and trying to figure out what this retail outlet was going to be. And so for us too, I mean, look at the deep values we have, the, I, the conversations we've had, the notions, and how our, the, the space, even in the process of what we've been doing with it, has morphed and changed and found realization. And we look at an idea and it doesn't work. And this is only on two dimension. As we sort of explore it more in model form and really understand what it's going to be, we're gonna understand so much more about it, but we're in a making process collectively. Mm. And I think that that's, that's only, only bodes so well. I have to say, like as chair of the campaign, anybody who wants to buy a book, all royalties will go right to the building. So how about that for a commitment? Okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think it'll take us too far. But anyway. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Thank you. Uh, so, so before we open it up, I just, I, I just want to make sure that here at ICAR, we talk about the spiritual piece of all of this. Um, what it means, uh, you know, on the surface, you can begin to understand it, what it means to go to a place of the unknown, what it means to be willing to enter mystery, what it means to be able to engage in that which we don't know, but understanding that is a key part of making a relationship with God. Um, now, a seven ishma, as you referenced earlier, in terms of mishpatim, in terms of what that we will do and we, we will hear and we will understand, we will do and we will understand that, the, that, the, that what the Israelites say at the moment of accepting the covenant is 
we're gonna only know this from a creative engagement. We're mm -hmm. only gonna know and build a relationship with God through a making. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I read recently too that um, the Mishkan is like act two of the creation story. Act one being in Bereshit, but act two being the building of that structure that we were talking about that was gonna welcome in, mm -hmm. allow us to access mystery, and it was going to create the possibility of God in a collaboration. Human beings make mm -hmm. it, but the divine, the Shekhinah, is able to enter it and be present in it. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was a beautiful way of connecting to the Bereshit story as well. Mm -hmm. And that, 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 that it only comes and the possibility is only made available through that making. Oh, and what we make is beautiful. It's make really is beautiful. beautiful, and there's an incredible sensitivity to the physicality of the space, so that it, because it, because beauty can inspire the best parts of us. Right. So. And something that is prescripted too, very closely. Again, beautiful. there are clear constraints, mm, but through those constraints, possibility was able to occur. Beautiful. So I wonder if um, if there are any questions. If people want to add anything, yes, Professor David Myers. <laughs> Do you mind? The, oh. No, I, oh. Such an interesting conversation. Thank you so much for uh, being here. Um, just a, a quick thought and maybe two comments. Um, a thought is that there's, sure, I'm sure you relate to this, the equivalent of a cigarette smoke for me has always been chocolate. Mm -hmm. um, so now you can make them all. So if you're going to make them all. I understand that. The, the oh. equivalent of a it's, it's, it's okay. I'll repeat what, uh, if I'll, you don't have to take it. I'll repeat what you said. So the equivalent for me of, of a cigarette break is, uh, is the Sabbath. Um, very often at the end of the Sabbath, I write down these sort of really critical thoughts. Yeah. I didn't have an opportunity to, to record uh, because I had unstructured time, not the most intensely work. So it's this interesting dynamic between work time, defined as such, and yeah. the alternative to it. Is its own dynamic. But what I just want to say are two points about that. The, the, the iterative process, or what I think of as the call response of the creative process. Um, the first is, for me, it's really all about the language. And I think of a spectrum that ranges from um, one pole being fixed meaning, and the second pole being Our job is to find the echo point between those two mm. through that iterative mm. response. Beautiful. Beautiful. Right. And I think in this regard, uh, the traditions of literary theory from the new criticism, which elevates the role of the critic to a position equal to that of the author, mm. all the way up to postmodernism, which may, some would say, take it too far, but also really elevates the role of the critic as an essential the process. And this, I think, leads to the final point I was going to talk about further, and that is in the making of, and this is what for me means meaning, in the making of meaning, make the note for me that process, that iterative call response has to be about the making of meaning. So as an historian, sort of the necessary condition for success is to kind of get it right through archival reconstruction. The sufficient condition for success Lovely, so lovely. Thank you so much for that. That that's 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 wonderful. And and um, I, I do have to say that conversation and dialogue. Again, we can get into the spiritual part too of of what that is. But conversation and dialogue are such an incredibly important part of this whole process too. Especially for the design community. Especially when they're working collaboratively, or for that matter, in the theater. And it is only through that kind of conversation. But the conversation just doesn't happen among people. It happens with material, it happens with ideas, it, happen, it happens on a, on a multitude of levels to get to that point of meaning. And it's a, it's a, it's, it's a part of the making. It's not, it doesn't stand outside it. And it's, again, a reiteration of this isn't a, manif a manifestation of some pre-figured out vision here. That's mechanical.
Also, just with the, for the first thing that um, that David said, which I don't know if everyone heard, was just that the cig the equivalent of the cigarette break for him is um, is Shabbat, like just really stepping away, for, stepping offline, and, and living in a different kind of time and space that allow that that generates um, in a different way for us. So, thank you. Well, probably better for your lungs than the cigarette break. I, I, and I just want to add, and and the conversation continues when the spectator or the reader begins to engage with the work. And a new dialogue ensues, and different meanings and different level evolve. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Lorraine. Hi. Thank you for opening this dialogue. Um, I teach writing, creative writing, uh, creative memo writing, Jewish poetry, whatever, and I write. I approach everything a little differently. I believe in multiple levels of reality. And one of my levels of reality is to live in the world of imagery. I grew up as a dancer. And from imagery, I just move into writing. It's a natural thing. The other point I wanted to say is that I believe everyone has the potential to be an artist. And in all the years that I've been teaching, people from 86 countries and people from here, I've seen the greatest nurturing and growth in the artistic world. Mm. And as Jews, I think we have an advantage because we are part of the creative process, the creation. We are here to guard the creation. We are to help make the creation go forward. And I feel there's always a divine underlining to whatever I do. And so those are little different vignettes to add to your repertoire. Thank you. Thank but thank you, you for opening thank this you. And, and And just um, so you know, I, I think your work with imagery, um, I, I actually don't think we're talking about different things at all, because that, the way in which an image comes to you and then opens up possibility is what um, a number of the artists and designers that I work with call just, th th those are their entry points. But as you said, you enter through the image and then you write and then you make and then you discover. So I actually think it's, it's very parallel and very much along the same lines. Thank you. Couple things. First of all, Rabbi, when you say you have no artistic ability, do you think not creating Ikar oh. <laughs> and the way you do things is not, wait, that you are not an artist in well, another way? I also des I hand design my three children, mm -hmm. and I think they're, yes, they're right. also works of art. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like in our when we play Pictionary, you don't yeah. want to be on my team. That's what I'm right. saying. No, but this is, Ikar is a work of art. <laughs> Thank you, And the Gary. way that you Thank approach you. it. Yeah, here, which here. Is, which is why I think it resonates with here, everything here. Lauren is saying. Lauren, I want to say a couple things to you. Lauren will understand this. I've been in the advertising business. So when I worked for McCann Erickson and then I moved on to Shiat Day, Shiat Day is considered like the top creative shop in the, in, in, at that time in the world. Jay Shiat sits me down and he says to me, at McCann, you learned creativity on a big palette. He says, but here it's framed in into the tightest box and your job is to blow up that tight box. Mm -hmm. That's when the creativity becomes powerful. So when you were talking at the very beginning about um, the framing in, it resonated for me so much back to 30, 40 years ago right, right. Um, as to what I learned, which I've never forgotten. The other thing that I wanted to say is I often think about tohu vavohu, and I think to myself, it's anything but chaos. Mm. Because if you say the words, there's a rhythm to it, tohu vavohu, there's an order to it, and it's where all of creation takes place because after tohu vavohu, then we get everything, we get man, woman, son, I mean, everything starts to come. And I began to realize tohu vavohu was the matter of creativity. It, it's not a chaos. Mm. Nice. I, Gary, I just want to say, I think that blowing up the box only has meaning when there's a box to blow up, right? Like, the, to, the, to the idea of the constraints help create the possibility of, of art, of generating art within. But it's the constraints that also make it meaningful when you break through one of the walls, which occasionally can happen. And what if those students came back, not with a three to five minute film, but instead with like a painting? I mean, it would be meaningful only because the constraints actually existed. And I think that's true about religious practice too. Like those, those few moments when I consciously and knowingly have um, gone against the tradition, I've, it's been meaningful because I know where the traditional boundaries are and feel bound by them, except I know that there are also some rare exceptions. Yeah. 
This is terrific. Um, I think about this quite often. This is Wendy. I'm Wendy. Hi, Wendy. Uh, Wendy Becker. Anyway, um, several things come to mind. We were talking about inspiration where we find it. I always say it's bed, bath, bus. Bed, when we, as we're going to sleep in our dreams, as we're waking up, this is where great amounts of creativity mm. have occurred for me. Bath, in the shower, in the bath, in water. Mm -hmm. Bus when I'm driving, if I'm on a train, if I'm, in that motion. movement, just movement forward. Yeah. And it takes it, it, great things often. This is bed, bath, bus. The other thing, uh, as an actor, I remember working with a director. And um, he said, I want you to study intensively, study this character, get everything down. I want you to know everything about it. And then before you walk on stage, forget it all. Mm. Let it all go. And I think that that is the essence you're talking about. The right. things that you're talking about also, Rabbi, that we take in all these things. Great dancers know the positions, know, you know the rules. As a musician, as a writer, a songwriter, I studied music. All that Bach, all that stuff is in me. But when I sit down at the piano, it's, a, some, it's an absolute, I, I feel myself step back. It's get out of the way. Mm. And then what's going to come? I love playing this game. I, so where are my hands going to land? Wow. And where does that go? Where is that taking me? And, um, it's a, it's, and it's definitely very spiritual. I kind of liken it to praying. Mm. When I come to pray, I'm lo looking at these words, and oftentimes I'll what what flashes out on me, and I I don't know it's a surreal kind of experience, but when I'm praying with my heart, with my real uh, intents within me, there's something maybe that's also that sense of, that it's a similar sense. It's I improvisational. Get. I think oh, prayer sure. as improvisation. Absolutely. Even with even with all that we are. Life is. Life, life is. is. Life is totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stick with prayer for a sec, though. But with all all the structure that we have as Jews with prayer, and yet the power of that structure to to be open to allow us to improvisationally find our way. Speech is improvisational. What I'm doing now is. I'm making to know. I don't know fully how I want to, I have a sense, mm -hmm. but I am shaping what I am doing. It's every day. It, this is a making of speech here. And the, and the other thing I just want to say to you too, which is so beautiful what you said, was Keith Jarrett talks about emptying mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. Before that concert in Cologne, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. That amazing story in the broken yeah, piano. Yeah, yeah. Does everyone bit, know right? the story? Of, yeah? It's just a crazy okay, story. Maybe we just click, can we click, like the, we have to wrap soon, but can you share a little, the context of the story? It was, it was rainy and there was a broken piano and he was going to leave and this young woman who was producing it came and was able to convince him to get out of the car and come back and He was going to walk away from the concert because she ordered the wrong piano. Yeah. Well, and it was also broken too. And it was broken yeah, and there were yeah. like tens of thousands of people there waiting and he's and, about to walk off. And out of that mess he made what is probably... The most amazing right, piano right, concert. Right. Right. But he talks just like you did. Of, you, you have to empty yourself. But who yeah. has greater skill as a musician? Who knows the piano better? Who knows... Again, that skill and freedom relationship is so powerful. Yes. And Keith Jarrett and what that moment was, a total make-to-know concert, Right. was all about exactly that and is exactly what you're talking about. You had it, and then when you sit down at the piano, you let it go, you let empty go. yourself and engage. And yeah, yeah. we talked talk about it's, that And it's well. It's almost it's, um, like cellular memory takes over in a different kind of sense. Right. But a different one, part one, of yourself, right. yeah. One last thing. We talk about um, divine in intervention. <clears throat> in Bereshi, we are made in God's image, and I always believe if we are in God's image, then there, we are also creators. We are co-creating with God every day. How Amen. we live our lives. Yeah. How we Amen. live our lives. Yeah. So that's, and I have yeah. to run, unfortunately. Okay. But this we, is fantastic. We're gonna, we're gonna wrap, thank you, Wendy. We're going we're gonna to wrap up. I just want to say, if you haven't read the book yet, I hope you will. It's incredibly 
Beautiful. I'm so curious how much of this you had already figured out before you sat down with pen and paper. I, I didn't know a thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't know a damn thing. Yeah. We make it up for the proposal. Um, so, I, so, Lauren, thank you. You inspire me so deeply, and thank you for inspiring our community. And also, just I love this community. I love every yeah, single comment that just emerged. Yeah. So thank you, you beautiful and wise souls, for sharing uh, this lovely conversation Thank you, with Rabbi, us. very much. Thank you yeah. to Rochelle and Lauren. We're gonna, um, Lauren, uh, if you'll stick around for a couple minutes, I know there were a few more questions, but I don't wanna keep folks past two, and we'll just uh, do Birkat Amazon if anyone would like to join me. Thank you. 